Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. Welcome and thank you for coming to the second of three workshop, workshop sessions that are part of our 2022 Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Summit. Last Thursday afternoon, our first workshop session addressed equitable school funding and the We the People PA campaign's top priorities for this year. And both of these workshops are now available for viewing online and links to the recordings are being placed in the chat. If you have any questions for the panelists or anything about the report, please put them in the chat and questions will be shared with the panelists as time permits. Lavana, can you please share the PowerPoint? Thank you. Thank you for joining us today for the housing workshop. And it's entitled Addressing Housing Affordability in the COVID-19 Period and Beyond. Overview on curbing evictions in Pennsylvania, emergency rental assistance, and possible solutions. Next slide, please. So the housing report that we jointly work together to produce is entitled Housing Affordability in Pennsylvania in and after the COVID-19 pandemic, evictions and recommendations to help families. It will be accessible through the PBC, PC and KRC website. Next slide, please. The share of renters has grown over the past two decades. They include mostly women at 54%, and many are families with underage children at 48%. Also, they are disproportionately Black and Latino. Just under a quarter of renters are age 65 years old or older. Also notice that from 2000 to 2017, 78% of the net growth in households were amongst renters. In 2010, Pennsylvania had a 1.4 million um, 1.4 million renter occupied units. And as of 2019, Pennsylvania had 1.6 million occupied units. Looking at this slide, these families earn lower incomes as compared to Pennsylvania's residents. About 27% of renter households in Pennsylvania earn extremely low incomes. If you take a look to the graph to the right, notice that the households who are very low low income to extremely low income are, put, are more likely to be cost burdened or severely cost burdened. They earned, so not only do these families have lower incomes, but they are more likely to allocate more of their income towards rent. They earned 30% of area median, median income, but allocated 30% or more of it towards their rent. Next slide, please. Pennsylvania's housing affordability problem was only worsened during the pandemic. If you look at the graph to the left, sorry, to the right, low income families who are cost burdened grew more than very low income families and extremely low income families. But all of these families that are shown are close burdened. Next slide, please. Eviction moratoriums and rental assistance have been helping families in need during this time, but the end of the moratoriums and slow distribution of aid has put families' lives at risk. Next slide, please. Implemented moratoriums, as we see here, had the effect of reducing the number of eviction filings. But the end of eviction moratoria, with the end of eviction moratoria, we see that eviction filing rose. Next slide, please. So I'm going to describe some of the policy recommendations that we discuss in our report. Next slide, please. Some short-term policy, policy solutions that we discuss is one, pursuing solutions via the legal system including implementation of eviction diversion programs and educating all president judges 
about the COVID-19 widespread impact on vulnerable renters and available resources. Two, improve outreach by helping families and individuals apply for and receive rental assistance with applications and by attaching emergency rental assistance program applications to hearing notices. Next slide, please. Three, improve the design and implementation of ERA programs, including use of a more equitable funding formula, reducing administrative barriers and promoting data transparency. Number four, request reallocation of a new ARP funds for shorter counties and cities to implement ERA funds and to fill in, oh, sorry, <clears throat> eligibility gaps. Next slide, please. Some long-term policy solutions we discussed include funding a universal right to legal counsel program for renters at risk of eviction. Number two, to pursue legislative solutions to eliminate evictions without good cause and sealing eviction records to protect tenants from being refused housing. Three, harness the power of data collection and visualization to forecast and track eviction hotspots for mitigation. And number four, to fund a long-term emergency rental assistance program in the state and make additional funds available for increased affordable housing development. Next slide, please. Thank you. Some of the main takeaways that we wish for you to hold on to today. Next slide, please. Includes the importance of mitigating evictions due to the disruptive nature of renters, families, and communities. And lastly, the need to create a permanent rental assistance program in the state of Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now we will transition to our housing workshop panel presentations. Some of the experts, the housing experts that we've worked with and consulted are joining us today to provide more insight into these issues. Starting, with, starting us off first will be Patty Torres, organizing director of Make the Road PA, then Gil Sports, associate director of policy and programs of Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania, and third, Robert Damewood, staff attorney at Regional Housing and Legal Services. Patty, I'll hand it off to you. And she will be sharing some stories of some members from Make the Road PA and their experience with the ERA program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kihende. Um, good afternoon, my name is is Patti Torres, and I'm the organizing director with Make the Road Pennsylvania. Uh, and for those that don't know, Make the Road Pennsylvania is a community-based organization that has a committed membership based on low income and working class uh, people of color, primarily um, immigrants, non-union union workers, and renters. So we fight for respect and dignity for our families in our communities. And at the core of this is safe and affordable housing for all. Um, so Make the Road PA is committed to grassroots advocacy and uh, organizing to, uh, to have inclusive, equitable and visionary housing policies that our, our communities, communities need, such as the policies uh, recommendations that this report uh, and Gehenda just mentioned. Um, and, you know, Pennsylvania does not have um, preempt local rent control or inclusionary zoning or source of income discrimination. So there's so much that we need to do to support renters and small homeowners in our state. Um, and we have, we have over a, a million and a half renter households in, in Pennsylvania and 32% of those state uh, wide are renters. And so, we, we know that we need to make sure that we need to increase the access to affordable housing and provide affordable housing um, for our communities, right? And, and right now we have an opportunity given, given the funding that we have in the state level and the budget negotiations that are happening to fund a permanent rent relief program. And I will make, be making that case by sharing the uh, stories of our members. Um, 
But again, I, I want to emphasize how this is our moment to demand that investment in our communities. Our communities should have the right to, to live in healthy and safe and affordable house, uh, homes. Um, and so um, Make the Road Pennsylvania uh, has been supporting our members to apply for that rent relief. We uh, created navigation uh, rent relief programs in um, both of the cities we work on, in Reading and in, um, in Philadelphia. And we were able to support more than 200 um, members directly support on a one-on-one -on -one basis to apply for rent relief. And we were able to give information about the program to more than um, 1,800 um, uh, community members in our uh, both uh, in our three cities where we have organizing centers in Allentown, Reading, and Philly. Um, and we have we're calling on on a, a permanent rent relief. Uh, program fund because we know our communities need it and that and right now there is um, the money to fund the, these these programs and this so so despite that a challenge that we have ahead of us not having enough money the long term to support our renters the the program itself has been um, very challenging um, uh, to have our members access to our communities access to that rent relief. And I, I'm going to showcase two uh, stories of our members. Unfortunately, they weren't able to come here, but this, their stories are also in the report. Um, so Celia Moncada, um, a renter in, in Reading, um, moved in, uh, to, to Reading 18 years ago. Uh, she had four children, um, and unfortunately, three of her four children were deported back to Mexico. And after leaving her abusive husband, Celia was left to care for her youngest daughter, who unfortunately was diagnosed with schizophrenia at, at age 14. Um, and so Celia was left alone with her daughter, and every day has been like a battle, right? To, to care for her daughter and make ends meet. Um, so as a single parent of a child with a serious illness, Celia was forced to choose between work and family, food and rent, and with no support. Um, and so because, of, because a mental health is unpredictable, um, Celia would often have to work two or three days to make money to, that she needed to pay rent. Uh, in a studio apartment where she and her daughter live. Um, with, with, when her daughter uh, had a crisis, Celia had to leave work and come home to look after her. When she needed to be hospitalized and, and no beds were available in, in PA, Celia and her daughter had to, were sent far away in different states so that she can get the treatment that she needed. Uh, and, and Celia uh, had to leave behind her work, borrowing money, um, to be able to care for a daughter. And so this forced Celia to make the decision between you know, eating and paying rent. And, and there have been many months with Celia couldn't pay those rents. And um, we supported Celia to apply for rent relief back in April of 2021. Now, the current emerg emergency rental application program, the ERAP guidelines require both the renter and the landlord to participate in applying for assistance. So despite her family having this very difficult financial and health situation, the landlord of Celia's apartment refused to complete his part of the application. So saying it, 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 like it didn't benefit him and he didn't want to get involved. So although Celia submitted her portion of the application to help local um, ERAP office process her application. Her landlord's refusal to participate did not allow her to get that support that needed. Um, so uh, we are we're following up on that on that case because we have pressured for specific cases to, to be processed, but this is a specific case of, of Celia. Um, is not is not the only one um, that uh, that she's going through, and I um, and and so we're 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 calling so that without a doubt renters can can be able to apply without the landlords 
um, um, also having to apply to the, so that applications can be processed because we see this over and over again in the different applications we've supported um, and the, the the applications have taken so so long um, so I I want to also share the story of of one of our member leaders who went to Harrisburg yesterday and she um, shared her testimony. And she's one of our members that thankfully was able to get rent relief. Um, and her name is Betania, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Miguel Di Lara. It's not Betania Lara, Miguel Di Lara. So we, we both went to Harrisburg yesterday and Bet uh, Miguel Di is a, uh, is a mom of three children, and and like so many, due to the pandemic, um, Miguel Di lost her job and fell behind on rent, and she couldn't pay the seven hundred and fifty per month um, that only had water service included. You know, she had to pay the bills of gas, electric, and healing bills, and also the basic necessities for her children. Um, so we helped her apply for the emergency, emergency rental assistance program, which is now, um, um, it, it was until re last week closed and it opened recently for a couple of weeks until mid-April. Mid um, so this relief definitely helped um, Miguel Lee. She was able to overcome her economic situation a little bit. Um, and recently she had to move out from, from that um, apartment and was able to rent a house in seven hundred dollars, and the lender gave her that um, that house um, in in seven hundred because it needed a lot of repairs. Uh, the the kitchen and the bathrooms need so much work, and she was able she had to take it because she she was able to um, save save a little bit more money and be able to have more space for her kids. Um, so, uh, what I'm trying to say with this is that. Miguel Di was able to um, get support for that rent relief until um, I think November of, of, of last year. And that was super helpful for her, but she will, she will, she works, no matter how hard she works, she makes $11 an hour. And so of all the bills she has to pay and also uh, care for the basic needs of her three children herself, she, you know, told me uh, um, how she feels that she's submerged in absolute poverty because no matter how hard she works, she 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 can, you know, make ends meet. And so, that's why we're calling on um, a long-term uh, permanent rent relief program um, for renters like Migrandi. Like Kehendi just mentioned, how. Um, their households are considered cost burden if they spend more than 30% of their income in rent. And households that spend more than 50% of their income in, in housing are considered severely burdened. And so these are the renters that need support. And given that there is so much funding at the state level to fund programs like this, it's very, it's very important to do so. And we are calling on the, on the General Assembly to do so because the time to act is now. Um, and so I, I, I will pass it back to you, Kehinde, because I know we have more um, panelists to speak more on, on this issue. I think you're on mute. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you so much for your work and thank you for sharing um, members from Make the World PA stories. So next, we will be hearing from Gil Sports of Housing Alliance of Pennsylvania, who will be discussing eviction filings and lessons learned from county level ERA programs. Thank you, Gail. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kahindi, and to the great team at the uh, Center for budget and policy for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to review uh, some of the uh, findings um, from our uh, report, the Housing Alliance released just last month, which is a, an analysis of eviction filings in Pennsylvania. 
and then talk about, you know, what are some, you know, potential policy solutions. So what we found is um, tenant, protect tenant protections reduced eviction filings. Uh, we know that there are local programs happening, uh, local eviction prevention programs that are happening, uh, that are reaching mutually beneficial solutions where both tenants and landlords are, are walking away with what they need. Uh, we know that many communities are continuing to experience a high prevalence of evictions. Uh, some communities are more affected by evictions than others. And most eviction cases evolve rent in arrears. And with the end of the moratorium, as Kahindi noted, um, we are seeing an increase in filings. So this is very similar to uh, the, uh, the graph that Kahindi shared. But again, you know, it's looking at what are um, kind of what happened with filings. We had early 20. 20, we saw kind of the normal flow, of course, the pandemic broke out, the governor implemented his moratoria. There was a few days where, you know, all of Pennsylvania was unprotected and we saw quite a substantial surge. And then we saw that tamp down, of course, not nearly as effective as the governor's moratorium, but with the CDC moratorium. And then once that moratorium did end, we didn't quite see the same surge that we saw uh, in, in September of 2020 before the CDC moratorium uh, ended. And, you know, I think we had a lot more resources in place. Of course, there were the pandemic benefits, um, you know, enhanced unemployment payments, as well as the uh, child tax credit was, you know, putting money into the hands of people who needed it. Uh, we also, at this point, were seeing um, the, uh, the emergency rental assistance program was really uh, up and, and starting to move and really starting to gain traction. Uh, and, you know, not only was it gaining traction, while there was still significant backlog of applications at that time, I think, you know, the program was starting to build its reputation that, you know, it is going to pay uh, the full amount owed, it is going to, you know, address arrears uh, in a very real way. Uh, also, please note um, this report, there is an interactive uh, component on our website. So if you want to look at eviction filings over this two-year span for your county specifically, please be sure to check that out. So I wanted to really focus today's conversation around solutions. We saw two uh, promising um, best practices coming out of Chester County and Berks County. Uh, they were started during the pandemic and you know, definitely worked very closely with emergency rental assistance programs and very closely with courts. And we saw some pretty uh, impressive, um, impressive outcomes from these very small, modest programs. So it really does show that very smart targeted interventions can be really impactful for the, for the people who they are intended to serve. So the first community I would like us to take a look at is Chester County. Uh, they have an eviction prevention court. This was launched in September, 2020 by the Friends Association. Uh, there are three participating magisterial district judges. So it most certainly does not cover the entire county, but uh, does um, hit a couple of the districts where they were seeing really significant numbers of eviction filings. Uh, this program did incorporate pre-hearing contacts to tenants with information about resources, and then there was help at the hearing itself. We were uh, seeing both um, a, an attorney present as well as a court coordinator. So you had somebody who was there to work with the tenants and help do some negotiation with the landlords, and then also somebody who is really giving attention to that court relationship. 
And what we saw uh, within these three pilot districts is that cases were almost three times more likely to be withdrawn and uh, settlements were two and a half times more likely. So, um, you know, oftentimes with uh, the conversation around eviction, it's it's kind of has a, a a frame of, you know, winner takes all. It's a zero sum game. If, if I'm not winning, then I'm losing. And so when we see cases withdrawn and we see settlements happening, it means that some sort of compromise, some sort of common ground was found and that both sides are, are walking away with something that they're satisfied with. So um, again, I think that's just really, really important to see. We can also see, you know, again, looking at the blue bars or all of the places where uh, there is no eviction prevention intervention. We're comparing it between 2019 and 2021. And you can see in the gold bar that these are the places where there um, now are these pilots. So Prior to, to the pandemic, the gold bar was kind of outpacing uh, the other places in, in the county. And now you can see just that dramatic drop uh, of judgments for the plaintiff and you know that, that gain in withdrawn and settled. Uh, again, we were also starting to see a dramatic reductions of orders of possession. So again, you know, when thinking about the eviction process, it is very much a process and not a singular event. Uh, in order for a legal eviction to take place, the order of possession does have to be issued by the judge and you know, some sort of law enforcement legal entity, a sheriff or a constable will come and you know, physically remove a tenant from their home. So we also started to see those orders of possession also be um, reduced. And I will say the Friends Association, not only did they have this eviction prevention court, but they were also a local administrator of the emergency rental assistance program. So it really was this uh, good braining of, you know, really um, smart targeted supports for for tenants as well as you know the financial assistance that is needed to make landlords whole so our second example is coming from berks county uh, it was started in 2020 in the courtroom of uh, judge tanya butler it covers a district uh, in northern reading um, this program is um, not quite as formalized as the Friends Association program. It was actually just, you know, started by a retired attorney who had read the book Evicted and was like, this, this can't be the way that this is really working and I want to work on this issue and just started volunteering and was able to um, help pilot this program in uh, Judge Tanya Butler's courtroom. So uh, the one thing that was, you know, immediately noticed when, when this program was started, and again, this is one of those things where, you know, as the notice of eviction is going out, information about resources and representation are also sent along with that notice of complaint. And uh, basically people were told, come to court a half hour early and you can meet with a lawyer. And just even that alone, really changed the, the no-show rate of tenants uh, at their uh, eviction hearings. So that little bit of information and having that source right there based in the courtroom already had an impact before the hearing even started. And now what we saw in the uh, Berks County example is, you know, cases were more than four times more likely to be withdrawn. Um, while there wasn't quite the, the tight connection between rental assistance and uh, this particular program, there still was a partnership and a connection. So many people were connected to ERAP because of this program. Um, 
We also started to see that, you know, with this representation for tenants that, you know, we started to see that some issues were being uh, raised and defendants were starting to uh, in their cases uh, at a greater rate. So again, we can see that, you know, just a little bit of intervention um, in a really, really targeted way within the court setting can have some pretty dramatic impacts. We also saw a significant reduction in uh, orders of possession in Judge Butler's courtroom. She is the gold bar here compared to uh, not only other folks within the city of Reading, but other folks uh, across the county of Berks. So in looking at, you know, what are some of the changes that have been happening since the end of the moratorium? Filings have increased. Uh, we expect that they're going to increase. We haven't seen a, a big change in, in dispositions, uh, you know, kind of places where, you know, landlords often win, we're still seeing them often win. And uh, we're also seeing that more orders of possession are being issued, which again, this is the situation where, you know, tenants are actually truly physically removed from their home. So in 2021, just to uh, share with folks, about 85% of landlords who won their cases were awarded rent in arrears. Uh, this is slightly down from uh, the 92% in 2019. Also, just to help you know, put some context, tenants who lose their cases, not only are they responsible for uh, rent in arrears, they are also responsible for any court costs and fees. Um, you know, eviction is much more complicated than just the number of filings, and it is an issue that is faced by far too many communities across Pennsylvania, but we do know that these eviction diversion programs can have pretty dramatic effects, and um, we do want to see them start to, to really be implemented in more communities across Pennsylvania. So with that, let's talk about some policy solution. Of course, um, to reiterate, you know, what Patia said, we need rental assistance, uh, really that emergency rental assistance to help people pay their rent. We would like to see a permanent program. Uh, we do know that there is legislation moving through uh, the General Assembly right now to add an additional 500 million for ERAP from fiscal relief dollars. Uh, that's um, Senate Bill 890 for anybody who uh, wants to contact their representatives and say, please support this. We also know that at the federal level, there is legislation that is uh, being introduced. So we have the Eviction Crisis Act. Um, and this is a bill that would essentially establish or, or make a permanent form of the emergency rental assistance program. It would be a national housing stabilization fund. Again, this is really geared towards helping families that are facing a one-time economic shock, whether that shock remain stably housed and provide one-time supports to help them uh, get back on their feet. Uh, one of the great things about this uh, piece of legislation that it, it has bipartisan support and bipartisan support in the Senate. Uh, both Senators uh, Brown and Bennett on the Democrat side, as well as Senators Portman and Young on the Republican side have uh, introduced this legislation together. We are looking to see a sister legislation introduced in the House sometime in April. Uh, also, other things that are uh, notable is, you know, with these uh, eviction crisis bill is much more resources for the other tenant supports and uh, eviction prevention activities that really are needed so that you can see this financial assistance get the most uh, traction. So that includes, you know, funding for landlord tenant mediation. Uh, you know, really looking at what is the outreach to tenants in neighborhoods that are hardest hit to ensure 
that they're accessing this resources. I think we've seen some really, really amazing models coming out of communities like Allegheny County and Montgomery County, where they really centered equity in their outreach for ERAP. And so we have some really great examples that we can learn from and that we can start to systematize in our, in our own communities. Uh, of course, we need engagement with landlords to find alternative solutions beyond eviction and, you know, getting folks uh, support uh, far sooner as they see their tenants start to struggle for whatever reason. And uh, expansion of legal representation for tenants. You know, as we said, just simply having a lawyer for the day in a courtroom in Berks County greatly and increase the tenant uh, show rate for their hearings. So uh, that, that access to legal representation and being able to um, access that in the moment where you need the information the most is absolutely critical. So uh, thank you. Please be sure to uh, view our interactive uh, report to see far more information about the eviction filings. And I will pass it back to you, Kahindi. Thank you so much, Gail. Thank you for that deeper dive into evictions and most importantly, solutions. Thank you. So I will pass it to Robert Damewood of Regional Housing Services. He will be speaking on the worsening issue of housing affordability in the state. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Kehinde, and, and thank you for the report. Um, I, I'm only going to speak briefly. I don't have a PowerPoint. I'll probably you know, uh, post links to a couple of news articles in, in the chat. Um, like Kehinde said, I, you know, I plan to step back from looking at evictions for a minute and, you know, let's discuss the, um, the housing market in general, um, particularly it's, it's failure to meet, you know, the, the housing demand for, um, you know, lower wage working families. Um, so, you know, and, and you know, it's, uh, that that failure, you know, pre-existed COVID, but it's getting a lot worse with COVID. Um, and you know, I, I think that's important for us to um, to acknowledge. So when when you know most people think about the problems that you know the economic disruption that that the pandemic caused, um, you know, they think about the disruption to families' incomes, right? And that's that's very real and you know, um, uh, you know, but it's but it's uh, only part of the problem, right? Uh, there's there's also disruption at the other end, at the pricing end. So, you know, as um, as the and you know throughout the country, as as the commercial market has um, flatlined um, because of COVID, all the investment that used to go into commercial real estate isn't just sitting around waiting for you know the commercial market to come back right it is looking for you know um, investors are looking for other investment opportunities and one of those investment opportunities is in residential real estate and that investment is coming in in a um, uh, in a harmful way in a, in a lot of cases so you know for instance um, you know, private equity funds have started to take a more active role in the real estate market, in the, in the residential market. And I'm going to put an article, a ProPublica article. Um, I just put the posted the link in the chat. Please take a look at that. It does a good job of explaining how the business model um, for uh, private equity firms in the residential market um, how it's harmful, how it's, their business model depends on increasing rents. So, and, and we're, you know, we're, we're seeing this in um, Pittsburgh, uh, you know, more and more recently. So we're seeing, you know, investment firms come in and make um, cash offers for currently affordable properties at above asking price, right? And, you know, that makes it difficult for, 
others, you know, whether you're talking about, you know, local landlords that don't intend on, you know, jacking up the rents um, or, uh, you know, preservation buyers, right? So nonprofits, um, uh, you know, entities interested in preserving, you know, affordable housing in the area makes it difficult for them to compete, right? Um, because, you know, if smaller mom and pops and nonprofits, you know, need to do some investigation before they can just buy a property. But private equity firms aren't doing that. They're making cash offers, no contingency offers at above asking price. Um, and what they do, you know, as, as explained in the ProPublica off article, is, you know, after acquiring a property, they will increase the rents and use that increased cash flow on their books to leverage additional investment that they then use to um, finance more acquisitions. And you know, so that's that is causing um, incredible increases in in housing costs. Uh, so I'm going to post another article um, about uh, recent increases in housing costs. So according to I believe, uh, I should have looked at this. I believe it's realtor.com. Um, uh, the year over year housing costs, you know, rental, rental costs, rental increase um, for 2020, uh, you know, in, in Pittsburgh alone was 18 and a half percent. That is astronomical. I mean, Pittsburgh has never seen housing cost increases like that. Um, you know, so by comparison for the three year period from 2016 to 2019, um, the total increase was 16%. So this one year increase is greater than the three year increase before COVID. And the three year increase was already, it already outpaced, um, you know, the, the modest increases in wages for non-college wage earners. Um, and, and so, you know, things were already unaffordable before COVID. They're getting far worse um, now with COVID. So, so yes, I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, take away from the, from the need for eviction prevention resources, for rental assistance, for, um, uh, you know, PA Supreme Court authorization for diversion programs, um, everything that uh, that Gail mentioned, everything that's outlined in Kehinde's report is vitally needed. But in addition to that, we really need to look at, at Pennsylvania's housing market and at, at ensuring that the market um, meets the housing needs for all families. And with that, I'll just, I'll leave it up there and pass it back to, um, to Kehinde. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for bringing our attention also to the housing market in, in Pennsylvania and also centering the need also for all families to have affordable housing. And I wanna thank our panelists um, from Patti, from Gail to Bob um, to, for helping us to look even today deeper into this issue around evictions and housing affordability and what could be done to really address this issue at a really crucial time um, such as this during the pandemic. So now we will have and turn to our panel Q&A. We encourage you to include any questions that you may have for our panelists in the um, comment box. And also we have the opportunity to answer some survey questions. We really would appreciate your feedback. We would like to, to, to hear back from you on how useful this workshop was, and also some feedback as to what future housing research can be done that would be helpful in your work. Thank you. Kehinde, I'm also gonna allow participants to unmute themselves um, since I feel like we've got a lot of friends and folks who are really interested in learning more. Um, I know the chat isn't always the easiest. So if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question out loud, please go right ahead in just a second, you'll be able to.
No, don't all talk at once. <laughs> Um, this is Lavana. I just was wondering if our panelists have any suggestions for what we can do as, um, you know, people who care about this issue. What are what are the best ways that we can engage with this to move forward some of these policy solutions? If if the panelists want to make some suggestions there. So <clears throat> this is Gail, I have some ideas. Of course, you know, anytime that there is um, a piece of, of legislation that can fund these programs, you know, being engaged with your elected leaders, whether they're at the state or the federal level, letting them know what matters to you and uh, speaking your truth to power to let them know how it is they need to represent your interests. Um, I also think, you know, as as great as it is to create, you know, all of these resources at the federal and state level, you know, local implementation can can make or break a program. So also being really um, engaged at that local level and talking to your uh, council members, whether it's city or, or county council members, and really talking about, okay, there's this great program, it could do these great things. Are we prioritizing the resources? You know, if there's funding that also allows for, you know, some housing stabilization in addition to rental assistance. Are we really putting it towards, uh, you know, more tenant representation, legal representation or mediation, you know? Um, Oftentimes I give a lot of webinars and a lot of trainings and, you know, I'll say like federal resources like CDBG can be used for, for mediation and eviction prevention activities. And then I get a call from somebody and they're like, well, I talked to my CDBG guy and he said, no, I can't be used for that because they're, they're still local decision makers and kind of local gatekeepers of the funding. So recognizing that, you know, you really have to kind of be engaged at, at all levels. And then um, just continuing to really, really hold those that you elect accountable for the decisions that they do or don't make on this issue. I, I received two questions in the chat directed at me, and um, I'd like to read them out and I can help answer some, but I'm sure others can, can weigh in as well. The first is what relief is available for working families facing mortgage foreclosure and eviction? Um, mortgage foreclosure is, you know, uh, the, so PHFA has created the um, HAF program um, with federal funding. Uh, from Treasury, and I can um, I'll dig up a, a a link to their um, to their you know portal or to their website in, in and post it in the chat. So there is an, so HAF is is the foreclosure version of of ERAP. You know, is HAF is the foreclosure is what ERAP you know is or was to rental assistance, and as um, folks have already mentioned, DREP is still available, but um, counties are running out of money. Uh, there will be you know, some reallocation soon, but it's not going to be enough to, um, uh, it's not gonna be nearly enough to meet the need, um, but it is still available. And so it, the other question has to do, uh, you know, was is FAIR funding still available? Yes, it is, FAIR funding is still available. Um, and, Bob, can you I explain? I'm pass sorry, that Bob. To the other, yes. Can you just explain what FAIR is to people who may not know and the acronym? I'm actually going to let Gail explain this. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, she's far more familiar with the program than I am. 
So FAIR is uh, the State Housing Trust Fund, the acronym, and, and I may be butchering this, but it's like the Pennsylvania Housing and uh, Housing and Rehabilitation Enhancement Fund, maybe it's something along those lines, but um, what it is, is it's a state uh, funding source. It is a, a housing trust fund, and the benefit of a trust is that it has a devoted funding mechanism that is not subject to um, an annual budget negotiation. So how FAIR is funded, currently it has three funding sources. It is uh, the receptacle for funds for the National Housing Trust Fund. Um, it does get a portion of Marcella Shale impact fees from uh, those counties that have active um, gas wells. And then the third source, which is um, the most ac accessible source that almost pretty much anybody can apply for is uh, taking a portion of the realty transfer tax uh, that is paid to the state uh, whenever you know you buy and sell property, and a portion of that is put into this fund where it is currently capped at forty million dollars. So this fund can be used for a wide breadth of activities and has been used for a wide breadth of activities, including you know homeless homelessness assistance programs, landlord engagement and incentives. Um, affordable housing development, home repair programs, uh, home buyer counseling, blight remediation activities, all kinds of, of different activities. Um, there is a move currently to get the cap raised on fares. So um, again, that is uh, something that uh, is another thing that you know when you're calling your your uh, state legislators to talk about getting uh, an extension or additional funding for ERAP, also say, hey, can you raise the cap on fare um, as well? So um, it looks like it's going to be introduced in, in the Senate by again bipartisan legislation by Senator Vogel and. Haywood, I think. I hope I'm getting that right. Uh, but, um, and I think uh, there'll be a, a sister bill in the House as well, introduced by Representative Dowling. So that is the, the FAIR program in a nutshell. Um, it is managed by the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency, uh, and it has, um, you know, an annual application that usually opens up, I think, in the spring. And again, you know, any number of entities um, really can apply for this to create a, a local program to support any sort of affordable housing, uh, community development, light remediation activities. Ivana, I'd like to add to the, the question you said about how we can engage on, on supporting the, these policies. So um, I, wanna, I wanna just call to how important it is to to work in coalition because we can never win something alone, right? And 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 make the road Pennsylvania is, is committed to a long-term vision working for housing affordability in the state. And and that it's led by renters and small homeowners. That's the key part here because they have to be front and center and the voices uh, uh, of 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 this of this of the need and expressing the need of these policies. So that's that's my my contribution to that. And 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 what I'd like to add to this is that it's not enough to like fight for a legislation that uh, has intentions to, to meet the needs that we have in our communities. There's this aspect of enforcement that is so, so concerning and like the, the bad policy uh, creation that also impacts our communities. Um, I did not mention the story, the story of, of Benita Gonzalez, uh, who's another member of Make the Road Pennsylvania, who 
uh, because of the lack of transparency of the communication between ERAP allowed the landlord to double dip rent payments uh, while, while the family struggled. So because of this minor, you know, um, um, like uh, uh, this, that, this, not, it's, this huge, it's not minor, but it, 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 to solve it, it's super minor because you would just require the ERAP program to notify renters and landlords that the program uh, was processed. So right now, ERAP is not, uh, you know, um, notifying renters if the, if the program was processed, just landlords are aware about it. And Benita Gonzalez, um, who has lived 20 years um, in Reading, she and her husband has raised four, four kids uh, and, you know, they were struggling at the same time because of the pandemic. Um, Benita worked for many years, but ultimately had to leave her job and stay home. Um, and her husband uh, worked in a restaurant job and because of the pandemic, he had to, you know, he, he was laid off. And so Benita applied with us for, for, for rent relief and was given rent relief after nine months. So um, she was able to realize that she was, she was, uh, she finally got her ERAP program processed when she actually contacted the ERAP uh, program and was told by them that the Lano has been receiving her rent all throughout these last months. And so the landlord was harassing her, saying that she was late in rent. She was, you know, asking for loans, doing everything that she could to actually pay the rent, like sacrificing, you know, so many things for her children to be able to pay her rent so that their, their homes is not in jeopardy. And here we go. We heard that the landlord was receiving the rent and also, you know, collecting collecting her, the rent from her. That's the double dipping that I'm alluding to. Um, and I will stop there, but it's, it's, it's also something that, that it, 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 we need to, you know, make sure that we monitor that when we're creating these policy programs that they're, they're also thinking about the renters and how important it is to have that clear and trans transparent communication. Thank you, Patty. I think that's really important. And you know, all of us working together, I think, is the key to um, making this work because we wouldn't know about that if you weren't working on the ground with, with renters and, and their application process. So, Candy, I, I don't think, I don't know if we're going to have time for the last question, but maybe we can share that. Um, if if we can share it with our speakers and put it in, in the Facebook comments on the on the public stream when this is over, and I'll let you wrap up. All right, Lavana, thank you. So um, we'll wrap up the panel Q and A, and thank you so much for Gail, Patsy, and um, Bob Damewood for joining us, and for all of our guests also for being here with us today. Um, and I, I just want to share some closing remarks. So our 2022 budget summit concludes next Thursday afternoon, April 7th. And our third and final workshop session, followed by a closing plenary, um, is next week's um, workshop that will take place from 1 p.m. to 2.15. Just like today's workshop, um, we'll be offering two workshops concurrently. The workshops are respectively focused on fixing the state's regressive tax system and leveraging federal infrastructure funds to improve jobs and benefit communities. There will be a, a short break after the workshops conclude and then the summit's closing plenary um, session will begin at 2.30. This will be a panel discussion featuring five progressive champions in the state house discussing their proposals to invest the billions of dollars in unused ARP funds, American Rescue Plan funds, and surplus revenue to build a brighter Pennsylvania. More information about the workshops and the panel discussion is available on the summit webpage. Thank you again for everybody joining us today. Thank you panelists also. Take care. <laughs>